Five and Thomas. So usually most of the speakers here are doc we call them doctors because they're PhD, but this is a real medical doctor. Uh, he's uh, he's an adjunct professor at NIAS in Bangalore, but he's also a professor of physiology at ESI Hyderabad. Uh, his academic and research interests are in medicine, physiology, physics, mathematics, and neuroscience. This current research is focused on physical optics. So we'll talk about some of his work on optics based on some of his recent papers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor Jim, for this opportunity. So I'll be speaking on uh, something that is found in every physics textbook. It's called wave interference. And uh, some of the work that I've done in this specific area, uh, which is a contrast to what's found in the textbooks. So I think the best place to begin with a little bit of history, I'll go through it quickly. So the theory of wave interference, the idea that light is made up of waves, it started with this gentleman, Christian Huygens, uh, a Dutch mathematician who lived way back in the 18th century. And in 1690, he proposed this idea that uh, light propagates in the form of waves and those waves move forward in such a manner that every point on the wave front acts as a source of secondary disturbances. So what does that mean? It means this is the diagram from his textbook, uh, from his treatise. So you have a point source A and that gives a spherical wave front. And every point on the spherical wavefront acts as a secondary source of disturbances, which are take the uh, shape of a spherical wavefront. And the common tangent to all those spherical wavefronts together forms the position or determines the position of the wavefront at the next instant. So this is the illustration that he uses in his uh, treatise to describe how light propagates forward. So this was the first uh, mental imagery of how wave propagation happens. Uh, now, it's also called Huygens principle or Huygens construction, and it's a very useful method because it helps in explaining how light moves in the forward direction, otherwise known as rectilinear propagation. So if this is the primary wave front and every point on it acts as uh, secondary disturbances. The next way of position of the wave front is over here. It's actually a tangent to all those spherical wave fronts. And it doesn't matter what the shape of the wave front is, whether it's plane or spherical, the, this principle can be used in, uh, in either case. And another powerful uh, place that Huygens principle can be used is to explain things like the laws of reflection and the laws of refraction. So these are the three strengths of Huygens principle. Of course, there were some limitations that were uh, identified by the critics of the wave theory. That is, if indeed each point acts as a source of spherical disturbance, it means that there's a forward wave as well as a backward wave. But Huygens' theory principle doesn't explain what happens to the backward wave. Why is it only the forward wave that matters? Another thing that it doesn't explain is when light from a point source falls on a slit or an obstacle, uh, a shadow should be formed, which is called geometrical shadow, and light tends to bend around the corners, a process called diffraction. So diffraction too cannot be explained by Huygens' construction. So that had to wait for, for 100 years. The wave theory went to sleep because, uh, mainly because Isaac Newton, his ideas prevailed and he believed that light was made up of a stream of particles and not waves. So 100 years later, a British physician and polymath by the name Thomas Young came along. He's the man who coined the terms that we're all familiar with, interference, momentum, energy, modulus of elasticity. He's the guy who coined all those terms. Between 1800 and 1803, he gave a series of lectures on all sorts of topics. And um, we're gonna stress mostly on the nature of light, the topics that uh, he, he focused on light. And he compiled all of it into two huge volumes called the Natural Philosophy. He's also credited with the invention of a special device called the Ripple Tank, which we'll see a little later. These are all the papers that he wrote uh, regarding the nature of light. Uh, the reason why he started thinking about light is because for his doctoral dissertation for his medical studies, he was very interested to know how the human vocal cords vibrate and produce sound. So his thoughts were initially focused on sound production and sound waves. And uh, he encountered a phenomenon in sound waves called beat phenomenon. That is, if you have two sounds of very nearly the same frequency, when they mix together, when they overlap, they produce something called a beat phenomenon. That is, the resultant wave shows waxing and waning of the amplitude. And uh, that is the volume tends to go up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, even though the individual waves themselves don't show any such fluctuation. 
and he started that got him thinking okay uh if this beat phenomenon happens in sound what if light was a wave like huygens said and if it was a wave how would we see it uh, in from the point of view of the beat phenomenon in sound uh, and he thought of things like the color of the uh, of the wings of insects like the butterfly and even birds uh, and here you can see there are some other insects you can see the various colors on it and he thought okay maybe this is the counterpart of the beat phenomenon that's seen in sound except in this case in light remember in those days nobody knew about light as a wave it was just Huygens imagination and Thomas Young thought of carrying it forward so uh, he thought, okay, these colors could be because of wave phenomena. And since waves exhibit something called interference, perhaps that's what's happening that is responsible for the various colors that we see on an insect. So what is interference? Everyone knows what this is, basic physics. That is, if the crest of one wave and the crest of another wave, they overlap, you get a resultant wave with a much larger amplitude. On the, uh, in the reverse scenario, if the crest uh, coincides with the trough, uh, what you get is cancellation. So one is called constructive, the other is called destructive interference. So from sound, he, uh, from the study of sound, he came to the study of light and he formulated two laws. Of course, he didn't phrase it in this way. This is how we understand it today in modern, um, in modern language. But more or less, he came up with these ideas, the superposition law and the law of interference, constructive and destructive interference. Uh, uh, he correlated it to the path difference. We'll come to that a bit later. Uh, so now the thing about light is that you can see things with light, but you can't see light itself. And that's why it's so difficult to probe the nature of light, whether it's a particle, whether it's a wave, whether it's something else altogether. So uh, he thought, okay, since sound exhibits uh, beat phenomenon and, that, and its logical counterpart part are the colors that we see on an insect wing in the case of light, and how, how would it appear in the case of water waves? So he built this device called a ripple tank, which is nothing more than a basin filled with water. And the two stylus-like uh, devices that dip periodically into the water and generate ripples, circular ripples. And these are his own diagrams, by the way. And as they produce these ripples, you can see they interfere with each other. They intersect each other. And you can see some nice, beautiful curves that come out from the interference pattern. And this is going to be the focus of our talk over here, these curves that he has drawn this is his own hand drawing. This is a modern day version of the ripple tank. This is how it looks, the big water basin here. There's a generator run by the current and the projection of the ripples can be seen on the screen with the help of a light. And this is a photograph of what we see in the basin. So you can see the nice beautiful circular ripples as well as the regions of constructive and destructive interference. So his study of sound and his study of water waves together made him realize, okay, maybe the same thing is happening in light as well. So uh, he decided, let me get some definitive proof that even light exhibits interference. And the experiment that he came up with in 1803, even though in the textbooks, we always hear Young is associated with the double slit experiment, he never really did the double slit experiment. What he did is a pinhole experiment. There's in a darkened room, he uh, made a small little pinhole in a window shutter and allowed one beam or shaft of light to enter, uh, sunlight to enter, and he split that light with the help of a very thin cardboard. And the two split end beams come and interfere with each other and form fringes on the back of a wall. This is the textbook version of the double slit experiment that we see in most optical books. This is his picture of it in his natural philosophy book. So you can see uh, they were not slits, they were two pinholes. And you can see that the curves that are formed that he actually correctly notes that these curves, which are actually the projection of the fringes onto the screen over here, uh, they follow a pattern of a hyperbola. Okay. Now, uh, historians of science say that he never really did this experiment. He just uh, uh, thought it up. It's called a thought experiment or the Gedanken experiment. It's something like what the experiment that Galileo did or oh, they say he did, he climbed up the Tower of Pisa and threw two heavy balls of different weights and saw that both of them hit at the same time. We believe Galileo never really did this experiment. So uh, historians say that even Young may never have actually done the double slit experiment. He may have just imagined, it, but uh, we're not sure about it. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to quickly uh, mention about the genius of Thomas Young. 
Young because the thing is he was able to correlate two different things that is waves produced on the surface of water and the bead phenomenon seen due to interference of sound waves. He was able to put both together and to infer something about light, the nature of light itself. Uh, to me, I feel this is something similar to Newton's insights regarding gravity because he, uh, the story goes, the legend goes that he saw an apple fall and he saw the moon in the heavens and he realized that the force which brings the apple uh, to the floor and the force which keeps the moon in its orbit, both are the same thing. And he united what was terrestrial with what is celestial and called it a universal law of gravity. So he was the first to do that. It's not like people before him never saw apples fall to the ground or see the moon in the sky. It's that he brought the two things together. Same thing with Maxwell. The moment he saw that the reciprocal of the square root or the product of permittivity and permeability gives a number which is so close to the speed of light uh, with the same physical dimensions of speed, he realized, oh my goodness, maybe electrical and magnetic phenomena and optical phenomena all united at some level. Uh, the same thing with Einstein and his discovery of the equivalence principle. So I feel Thomas Young deserves a lot more credit than he uh, receives you know, when it comes to inferring the nature of light from the nature of sound and water waves. Now, when, uh, I, uh, when Thomas Young came up with these ideas, then it wasn't accepted at all, for, mainly because of Newton's prevailing idea about particles. And also this man here, he wrote many scathing reviews of his uh, papers and that pretty much discouraged him from writing anything further on the nature of light. Also, another thing is Thomas Young was a doctor by profession and not a physicist. So much of his writing lacks mathematical grounding. The first rigorous theory of light interference comes from this French civil engineer, Augustin Fresnel, and he took Huygens' construction and he took Young's principle of interference, put both of them together, and he came up with this integral here. What this represents is basically this, that is, uh, you have the point source here, you have the spherical wavefront here, say that this is a point P. You wanna know how much of the field from point P0 actually reaches point P. And according to Huygens' principle, every point on this wavefront makes some contribution. And according to Young's principle, every point produces not just spherical wavefronts, wavelets, but wavelets that interfere with each other. So it should be possible to add the contributions of every point on the wavefront to get a total sum at point P. This is what Fennel did, and this is the notation of what he uh, formulated. And that helped in explaining things like, you know, diffraction when it uh, light encounters a, a slit, you can see clearly how it bends. A plane wavefront becomes more or less a circular wavefront. And also how when it encounters an obstacle, it bends around the corners and, you know, you see that the light actually forms a dot in the geometrical shadow. There's an interesting story behind this. Uh, when Fennel submitted his essay to the French Academy of Sciences, they were holding a competition to explain the nature of light. And on the panel were these five judges, all the famous names in physics. And these three were Newtonian in, uh, in their belief, that is, they believed light was a, had a particle nature, whereas these two believed that it had a wave nature. And these two, Bayat and Arrival, hated each other and they despised each other. And Poisson happened to read Fennel's essay and he said that this is absolutely ridiculous because if Fennel's theory is correct, it means based on his integrals, if light were to fall on an obstacle, then right at the center of the geometrical shadow, there should be a bright dot. And he actually calculated that and said that if it is true, then there should be a bright dot in the shadow, which is ridiculous, it can't be true, it's absurd. Arago did the scientific thing and he decided, let me put it to the test. And he put it to the test and he found, yes, indeed, there is a white dot, a bright dot at the center of the geometrical shadow. And thus, you know, uh, that uh, proving or rather helping in establishing the theory of uh, wave interference. So uh, what's interesting is Poisson gave the falsifiable test the, to uh, prove that it is wrong, but ended up, you know, proving that it is right. And guess what? That spot today is known as the Poisson spot. So the strengths are that it helps explain, you know, it overcomes all the limitations of Huygens' principle and Young's principle taken in isolation. And it makes very good predictions that are in corroboration with, uh, uh, with experiment. However, there's one main limitation that is, if light is a wave, then it should obey a wave equation. And here we have 
a wave equation in one dimension. This was developed by De uh, uh, Allenberg back in 1746. It's a one dimensional one and the three dimensional version of the wave equation was designed by Euler. So the idea is this, if Flannel's integral that you see here is correct, and if light is indeed a wave, then this integral should be derivable uh, from a standard wave equation. So that became a challenge, which uh, was taken up by Stokes and Kirchhoff. And uh, they actually did show that you can derive uh, the integral directly from the wave equation. But then Poincare, a few years later, investigated Kirchhoff's version of the Fresnel integrals. And he found that if, uh, if it is true, if it is correct, then it would imply that there are no waves at all. It's called the Poincare paradox. So uh, that was a bit of a confusing time. Uh, how can that be? And then it took the work of people like Rayleigh, Sommerfeld, and Martlin to actually uh, repair that. But still, there are problems. Even though they did repair it, uh, uh, the, the thing is the accuracy did not go up. It was like Fresnel's uh, work was far more accurate. Kirchhoff Fresnel work was more accurate than their work. So that's quite interesting, actually. In fact, you can read these two papers that describe all these developments. Uh, this paper describes it from the history of science perspective, and this describes it from the philosophy of science perspective. And uh, it's quite uh, funny actually reading this because uh, they've come to the conclusion that maybe truth is not necessary to get the right predictions in science, because the kirchhoff fresnel integrals give very accurate results, even though the premises on which it is derived are faulty and inconsistent. So uh, it's kind of a very uh, gray area right now. So anyway, in summary, this is how it has been going on in physical optics, starting with Huygens with his principle and uh, Young with his principle, and then Fresnel with his wave integral approach, and then Stokes all the way up to Martin with the differential wave approach. So where does my work come in? My work comes in exactly here, between 1807 and 1818, okay? I call it the hyperbola-based analysis because the uh, protagonist of this whole story is a hyperbola. We'll see what that is. It could have been done any time between 1807 and 1818. It could have even been done between 18 and, 18 and 1856. Somehow it escaped everyone's notice, perhaps because the wave equation was more important. So in order to understand what I've done, we'll just quickly go through the standard model that is uh, described in the textbook. So this is how it looks, the double, the double slit system. You have a uh, first barrier with a pinhole S or a slit S, and then you have a second barrier with two slits S1 and S2. You see that the circular wavefronts the, get divided into two separate wavefronts, and then they interfere with each other. And at some point P on a distant screen, you get a pattern of bright or dark fringes. It all depends on uh, the difference in the path between uh, S2P and S1P. If the difference S2P minus S1P, which we call the path difference, is an integer multiple of wavelength, you get a bright fringe at P. If it's a uh, odd integer multiple of a half wavelength, you get a dark, uh, dark fringe. Okay. So the geometrical analysis that's found in every textbook goes like this. So if you strip everything down to the bare essence, this is all you have. You have a triangle like this, and uh, you can calculate the path difference S2P minus S1P using some very basic geometry. And you find that uh, delta is equal to D sine theta. Theta is this central angle over here. And uh, the basic assumption over here is that the screen is placed very, very far away from the double slit barrier. So when D is much greater than small d, small d is the distance between the slits, capital D is the distance between the screen and the slit barrier. As long as D is much greater than small d, you can uh, safely presume that delta is equal to D sine theta. So why do they do that? Well, the further away it is from the slit barrier, the more you can approximate these two intersecting lines or rays of light as if they are parallel to each other in the vicinity of the slits. Now, if you ask me, this sounds kind of absurd. That is, the very idea of a par uh, parallel lines means that implies that the lines should not intersect each other. But over here, you're taking two intersecting lines and you're saying that, okay, we can approximate them to be parallel to each other. And then based on that, you're going to use this formula and uh, this kind of this method is used prolifically throughout optics. It's called the parallel ray approximation. Some call it the uh, pa paraxial approximation. Some even call it the paraxial paradise because 
And so much of information is yielded by just taking this approximation. It's, uh, it, it litters the optics textbooks. So this is the conventional path difference formula, delta equal to d sine theta. The condition for its value d is capital D much greater than small d. That's called the far field approximation. Um, and it's sometimes also called the asymptotic approximation. Um, now, if you uh, couple to this d much greater than d, one more approximation, that is the interslit distance is much greater than lambda. Then you can adopt something called the small angle approximation. That is theta is so small that you can substitute sine theta with tan theta. And if you do that, that is delta equal to d sine theta, replace it with tan theta. And then you can get uh, tan theta from this diagram is x divided by capital T. And then you can rearrange it and you'll get the classical results. This is what we find in the textbooks. So what we find in the textbooks for position of bright and dark fringes uh, is basically a result of two assumptions. That is D much greater than D and D much greater than lambda. You can think of this as, this is called a far field approximation. This is called a small angle approximation. So you can imagine what the limitations are of this, of this kind of a study of the double slit interference. Um, but before I go into the limitations, let's just talk about what the predictions are if you adopt such an approach, parallel ray approximation. One is that the fringes that are formed, this is the intensity pattern, this is the maximum intensity, minimum intensity, it's bright and dark fringe. That is the, the fringe width of every bright fringe happen to be equal to each other. The magnitude is D lambda by B. And the distance between any two fringes, it's exactly equal. Again, D lambda by D. So if you adopt the far field approximation and the small angle approximation, the two results that are predictable are the fact that the fringe width and fringe spacing are both equal. Now the limitations of this classical approach is that you cannot obviously use it when capital D approaches small d and when small d approaches lambda. At that time, this whole geometrical analysis utterly fails, uh, becomes utter nonsense. So to bypass, these limitations, uh, what I follow is something called the hyperbola-based approach. And uh, it's kind of new at the same time, it's kind of old. So uh, you'll see why uh, you can justify both those remarks over here. So the first mention of a hyperbola being involved in a double slit interference comes from Thomas Young himself in his 1807 book. He just mentions it in his figure. This is his figure of the double slit experiment. You can see that there are these curves that are formed, the hyperbolic in shape, and they intersect the screen, forming the bright and dark fringes. And in the caption to that figure, he just mentions the word that they proceed, the fringes proceed in the form of hyperbolas. He just mentions one small word like that. He doesn't derive the equation of the hyperbola. He doesn't substantiate why he believes that these are parabolas. So hyperbolas are not parabolas or some other type of catenary uh, you know, curves or some other type of curve. Why is it that he believes they're hyperbolas? He doesn't even go into, uh, he doesn't even venture into it. Now, the second mention that we see is from Augustine Fresnel's book that is in the context of diffraction. That is here you have a source of light, here you have a wire. The light falls on the wire, here's a screen, and uh, here's a geometrical shadow of the wire on the screen. And over here, uh, there's interference of light and a fringe is formed outside the geometrical shadow. And he actually found that the fringes that are formed in outside the geometrical shadow, they take the shape of hyperbolas, exactly the shape of hyperbolas. And he ventures on to actually prove that experimentally with the help of a device called a micrometer. He actually measures it and he sees that they are indeed hyperbolic in shape. But then Fresnel as well, he stops over there. He just mentions it and then drops it and goes on his own way. A third mention of a hyperbola in the context of the double slit interference is seen in the 1904 textbook. So this is like almost 100 years later after Fresnel and after Young in his book, uh, Theory of Optics. So there he says that, yes, uh, there's a locus, the locus of interference fringes takes the shape of a hyperbola or a hyperboloid in three dimensions. So this is a two dimensional thing, this is a three dimensional picture. But he only mentions it, that's it. He, just, he doesn't, again, derive the equation for the hyperbola. He doesn't uh, substantiate anything further than that. 
So that's something very strange why Thomas Young in 1807 and Fanu in 1818 and Schuster in uh, 1904. Schuster, by the way, is a student of uh, Lord Rayleigh. Uh, they didn't actually derive the equation of the hyperbola hyperboloid, but they do mention it. And uh, the reason they mention it is just to convey the fact that uh, the shape of the fringes are hyperbolic or the projection of the fringes towards the screen is hyperbolic. Um, so it, it's quite interesting just to muse well, how would the theory of diffraction and theory of interference have evolved if they had re-emphasized on this one point. Uh, in recent years, there's been a revival of interest in the hyperbola uh, uh, curve uh, and its role in double slit in interference. So starting way back in 2002, the many papers and many books uh, written by various authors. And uh, they all, once again, reiterate this whole thing, this whole idea that there's a hyperbola involved in the interference thing. But they don't exactly, well, they all, the one good thing is that they all at least derive the equation this time. Unlike Schuster, Young, and Fresnel, they at least derive the equation of the hyperbola. Uh, they start with this premise that uh, the uh, S2P minus S1P, there's a path difference that corresponds to any given fringe, whether it's dark or bright, it should be a constant. So they start with this ad hoc premise that S2P minus S1P should be a constant. That is, using Pythagoras theorem, you can just apply it here. The origin is over here, and X is the distance here. Capital D is the distance between the slip barrier and the screen. It's just simple geometry over here. And then you do a little bit of algebra, square it two times, and get rid of the square roots, and rearrange the terms, and you get this equation here. So this is the equation of the hyperbola. Okay, so in terms of the path difference delta, interslip distance d, this is the hyperbola equation. So it's good, at least they derive the equation of the hyperbola, but they stop there, they don't go any further. Uh, they just say start with this ad hoc premise that every fringe corresponds to a fixed path difference, derive it, and stop there. Now, why did they derive it? Well, there are three categories of authors, you know, one category they derived it just to establish the fact that the shape of the hyperbola, uh, shape of the fringes are hyperbolic. Another group just derived it to show that the asymptote to the hyperbola gives a better approximation to the position of a fringe compared to the, uh, the classical formalism. A third group of people, uh, they derive it just to establish the fact that the d sine theta approach is good enough. It's a good enough approximation. It doesn't have much error, maybe less than 3% or 2% error as far as visible light is concerned. So these are the three reasons why they derive it. But none of these authors derived that equation from first principles. By first principles, I mean the minimum of assumptions and the minimum of approximations. Uh, so perhaps because of that, they didn't get the, that, uh, they failed to exploit the full power of the formalism that was available through the hyperbola approach. So when I say first principles, I mean the original first principle uh, stated in 1690 by Huygens, that is, a point acts as a source of spherical wavefronts. So you have a point source S, it gives out a uh, circular wavefront which spreads out in all directions in uniform speed. So suppose that you have two such point sources, A and B. Say that A gives the wavefront out first and then B gives the wavefront. So they grow and they finally meet at one point first on the line joining A and B. And then they grow into each other and end up intersecting each other at two points, B and B prime. And as you can see, as they move from one point of intersection to two points of intersection, a curve is traced out. And that curve happens to be exactly the shape of a hyperbola curve. So that equation we saw earlier is the equation formed by the intersection of two expanding circular wavefronts. What you see on the right side is a three-dimensional version of it. That is, you have two spheres instead of two circles, two spheres. They grow intersect each other at one point, then in a circle and they trace out the shape of a hyperboloid instead of a hyperbola. So this is how it would look. You have a hyperbola in 2D, a hyperboloid surface in 3D. So I, I go on to prove the, this, that it is a hyperbola in a more rigorous way. I start with Huygens idea that a point source produces spherical wavelets and the locus of the points of intersection of the wavefronts uh, that move with a speed u and time difference of emanation delta T A B is a hyperbola. So the difference in my approach is I bring time into the picture, unlike uh, the uh, other authors. 
and the three-dimensional version of it. So this is how it looks. So this is the theorem that I've developed. Okay. And from this theorem in two dimensions, you can get the classical result, which the other authors derive by adopting the ad hoc premise that every fringe corresponds to a fixed power difference. And this is the 3D version of it for hyperloid surfaces. So what this means is simply this, that is you can take, this is your classical double experiment with the two sources, S1 and S2. They produce these circular wavefronts that interfere with each other and they trace out all these hyperbolas. Uh, in fact, because all of these hyperbolas share the same four by S1 and S2 the slits, we can call this a family of hyperbolas, confocal family of hyperbolas. So that equation that we see here this is actually representing this entire family of hyperboles consisting of many members and sharing the same slit sources as common folk. So now we can translate the geometry of the interference process from circular interference, a circular pattern to a hyperbolic pattern. All we have to do is now put a screen over here and you can actually, wherever the hyperboles intersect the screen, that's where you have your brighter dark fringe. So, why stop at a linear flat screen? Why not alter the shape of the screen as well? Why not use a semi elliptical screen and a semicircular screen? So you can see clearly where the hyperbolas intersect, these yellow dots, that's where you get your fringes. And one qualitative thing that you can see clearly is the fact that where these fringes are formed, the spacing between them is not as uniform as the classical theory predicts. You can see that in the center of the screen, they seem to be more crowded together. And as we move away from the center of the screen towards the peripheries, they start spacing themselves out. So that's a huge uh, divergence from in the predictions of the classical theory and this new high polar based approach. And so to test it, you have to you can just measure the uh, you can actually derive the formula for the angle corresponding to each of these fringes. So for the linear screen, you have this formula for the semi elliptical screen. You have this formula, and for the semicircular screen, this formula. So, using this, you can actually compare the distribution or study the distribution of the fringes on the varied uh, on the varied shapes of screens. You can also do one more thing. You can also measure the density of the fringes. That is, how many fringes are clustered together at a given point on the screen. And there's a formula for that as well. We'll derive one for that. That is the density of how many fringes per unit centimeter of the screen are occupied by uh, fringes. So we have one uh, expressions for each type of screen. So on a numerical graphical simulation of those formula, you can see clearly the, the, that in the case of the linear screen, the drop in the density of fringes from the center to the periphery is much faster than in the case of the semi elliptical and semi circular screens. You can also study fringe spacing. That is, what is the distance between the spaces for a given order of fringes? All you have to do is take the reciprocal of the fringe density. And from that, you can infer two very important laws, mathematical laws uh, that are obeyed by the fringe distribution pattern. One is that the density of fringes, there's a number of fringes per unit length on the screen, is directly proportional to the frequency of light used. And the spacing between fringes is directly proportional to the wavelength of light. These are two laws of fringe distribution. Uh, and the constant proportionality, of course, will depend on the configuration of the screen. Uh, another thing that this hyperbola based approach allows us to do is it allows us to do fringe counting, something that you cannot do with the classical approach, as you can count exactly how many fringes are there. Uh, the, Normally in the textbook, what we do is uh, we order the, we, we assign a number to each fringe. For instance, a fringe which is formed in the center of the screen, we assign it the number zero. We call it the central maximum. Uh, and then the ones on either side, we say that they have an order one, and then order two, n equal to one, n equal to two. Uh, instead of ordering just the fringes, why not order even the wavefronts themselves that are emitted by each source? So if, if this is the first wavefront that comes out of A, Call that p equal to one. This is the second wavefront. Call p equal to two, etc. All the way down. Do the same thing with b. Q equal to one. Q equal to two, etc. And you see that the spacing between the wavefronts is obviously lambda. So if the first wavefront on both sides intersect 
exactly at the midpoint. And that's where you get your central maxima. And, that, uh, uh, and the second fringe is formed over here, where the first wavefront interfere, intersects with the second uh, wavefront from B. So you can nice, get, make a nice, beautiful quantitative relationship between fringe order and wavefront order with this formula. And using that, you can actually infer what will be the total count or total number of fringes that are formed in a double slit experiment. And it turns out to be this expression over here. It's related to the ratio of the interslip distance and the wavelength of light. So interslip distance would be the distance between A and B, and lambda would be the distance between any two wavefronts. Now, that's interesting as, uh, as far as two uh, point sources are concerned. What, what if there are more than two point sources? What if there are three? What if there are four? What if there are five? What if there are n point sources? So in that case, how would this formula change? So you'd have, in that case, so you have S1, S2, all the way up to Sn. The formula becomes much larger, but uh, it's directly derivable from the two-slit experiment. So, all right. Now, what about the hyperbola equation? Can we generalize that for n-point sources? So this is for two-point sources. You get a hyperbola equation like this. It represents a family of hyperbolas here uh, with confocal hyperbolas. Now, suppose you have n such point sources, S1, S2 up to Sn. In that case, what would happen to the equation? You'd have a family of hyperbolas between every single pair of, uh, uh, of uh, slits. That is between S1 and S2, between S2 and S3, S3 and S4, and even between non-adjacent slits. That is between S1 and S3, and S1 and S5, etc. Okay, so it would look something like this. You'll have a family of families of hyperbolas. So is it possible to have an equation that represents all of these members of each and every family or family of hyperbolas in one single formula? Is that possible? Well, as it turns out, it is possible. We can generalize this equation to any n number of point sources, and it looks like this. In order to derive it, I uh, developed a, uh, a method called analytical induction, where we apply the principle of mathematical induction uh, something which is rarely used in optics uh, into um, analytical geometry, and that and you get this. It's a it's a new approach, a new method, and you get this equation. Okay. So this is the uh, generalized equation for endpoint sources because it represents not one family, not two family, but many family of families. I'm calling it the community theorem because a community, by definition, is made up of a family of families. So this is a community theorem. And from this community theorem, you can see delta ij actually represents the path difference between any two point sources. It could be the first point source and the second or first and the fourth, doesn't matter. The ith point source and the jth point source. And zeta ij and eta ij, they just represent certain coefficients, uh, uh, the, the i plus j minus three by two, j minus i, they're just multiplicative factors. Okay. So from this equation, you can, turn it into a bi-quadratic equation and uh, separate the delta square term uh, from this, just rearrange the terms, and you'll get delta path difference between any two sources, i and j, in terms of the coordinates x, y, and all the other things in the equation. And we know path difference is related to phase difference from the, just multiply by two pi by lambda, and you get the phase difference. So you get ultimately a phase difference formula between any two point sources. So this is ultimately what we need if we want to calculate intensity, phase differences between sources. So now let's calculate intensity. So if you have n sources, S1, S2, up to Sn, all arranged in a straight line, a linear array, and you have a point P over here, each one of these sources are producing wavefronts, spherical wavefronts of light, which contribute to the intensity at point P. So E1, that is the field from S1, if they're obeying a harmonic uh, wave, the harmonic wave law that is the spherical waves, then they should obey this uh, sinusoidal wave form sine omega t. And in the case of E2, it'll be sine of omega t plus phi 1, 2, meaning the phase difference between 1 and 2. You can do that for all endpoint sources. So this would be the field at, uh, at point V due to each of the individual point sources. So what about the sum total? The sum total, based on the principle of superposition, you get it just by adding everything up. And if you want to calculate the intensity, all you have to do is take the average of the square of this amplitude. And it turns out that you know it takes a bit of uh, cross multiplying and quite a bit of trigonometric identity applications. 
ultimately it comes boils down to something very very simple into a matrix of this form uh, of, of consisting of cosine elements of phase difference so between the uh, sources uh, all you have to do is it's a series sum all you have to do is add all these terms together uh, from cos phi 1 1 all the way down to cos phi n n and you get the intensity at point p so how do we do that if this is the matrix how do we add all the terms together do we have any simple way of doing that yes there is an easy way of doing that just introduce this all ones matrix that is a matrix j made up of just ones all you have to do is pre-multiply this epsilon matrix with the j and a j transpose and post multiply it with j and you get a formula like this and this actually represents the entire series sum the total sum of all of these things which is nothing more than the intensity this interval so you could also take two three and two four from the top and yeah yeah all those are there two three two four everything is there one 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 two one three up to one n two one two 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 three up to two n all the, the entire all the combinations possible so you end up with a formula like this so it's a nice, simple, succinct, brief formula. The previous slide. Yeah. Previous. Yeah. So, it's just uh, these endpoint sources, right? Each one is contributing a field to the point P. So this would represent the field contribution by one. This would represent the field contribution. Oh, uh, you, you ultimately get the interference because all of these are spherical waves which uh, go straight to a single point. And, okay. so, uh, so this is the this is the intensity formula. And from the previous thing, so here we have the inter the matrix J just you know pre and post multiply this matrix. You get this. And from the community theorem, we have the phase differences. So we know what cos phi one two for each of these terms. We know exactly what it is from this expression here. So all we have to do now is just substitute this into this big matrix here. Add all the terms together. You get your intensity i. Okay. So this is the in a nutshell, in one single PowerPoint slide. This is the Hyperbola-based analysis. Just uh, some important things that you should note about this formula. It's a very powerful formula because. Even though I've shown it here for a linear array of point sources, this summation doesn't really depend on the configuration of these sources. These sources can be in any configuration. It could be a linear array, it could be a square array, it could be even a cubic array or a spherical array. It doesn't matter what the shape and arrangement of these point sources are. As long as the point sources are coherent, same frequency, uh, you, you, this formula applies. So there's a quantum mechanical counterpart for this. This is a classical equation. The, count, class, the, the quantum mechanical one is called the duart dirac equation, but that's written with Dirac notation. It's quite different in many aspects. And if you want, you can even, over here, you can clearly see that uh, as the wave propagates from the point source to the point P, according to this, uh, that is E0 sine omega t, clearly the, the amplitude doesn't fall. It's like it's assuming that amplitude remains constant. It doesn't change as it travels through distance. But we know that's not true. When a spherical wave propagates, we know that the amplitude will fall right? according to the square of the distance. The intensity varies according to the square of the distance. So it's possible to accommodate even that into this matrix. The... All right, let's look at the textbook version of this multiple slit and single slit. In the textbook, what we do is we have n slits, one, two, three, up to n. And again, you can see here, what's, what's the nature of these arrays? They're all parallel to each other. And in, even in n-slit interference, they assume that all these rays of light, which actually intersect at a single point on the screen, in the vicinity of the slits, they're parallel to each other. And again, they use the formula d sine theta. Once again, d sine theta appears. So the same approximations that were used in the double slit experiment are also transferred into the multiple slit experiment. So you can imagine whatever limitations you have for the double slit experiment, it would equally apply for the multiple slit experiment. Anyway, based on the textbook approach, this parallel ray approximation, this is the formula that you get for intensity. And if you have n sources, if you say n goes to, let's say, infinity, not 10, not hundred, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, but the distance between S1 and Sn is kept constant. So what happens is you'll have 
so many point sources and the distance between each point source is almost zero. So n is tending to infinity as d tends to zero as this entire span remains fixed. In that case, you can even get single slit experiment. You can assume that the entire thing is just one slit made up of innumerable number of point sources, which are so close to each other that you can almost say D is zero or A capital N is infinity. In that case, this equation, this textbook equation reduces down to this equation here. Okay, so the task basically is, this is the new hypolar based analysis, and this is the old uh, multiple slit and single slit. The only thing we have to do now is to compare the predictions of the new with the old. So I did a numerical graphical simulation of it. Let's see how it, how it compares. So what you see in red is new, what you see in blue is the old. So this is for two slits. So you can see here the red pattern, it almost follows the blue pattern. It follows it best near the center of the screen, and that's point zero. But as we go towards the periphery, you can clearly see that the red, uh, you know, that uh, the bright fringes tend to separate apart more and more. They're not uniformly spaced like the blue peaks. What about three slits? This is about two slits, the double slit. What about three slits? Uh, we use the standard formulas, you know, and uh, the standard uh, magnitudes. B will be like. Uh, no, this is for the multiple slit. We will go to single slit last. Uh, this is for the multiple. We're using the multiple slit formula, uh, where n is a fixed number two, three, four, five, and then we'll go to n equal to a very large number. We'll see how it changes. So right now, it's we're comparing the multiple slit. That is, we're comparing this equation when n is two, three, four, and five with this equation when n is two, three, four, and five. So this is how it looks. So you can see the waveform morphology is exactly the same. You can see the subsidiary maxima, the minima, the principal maxima, all of them, they, they follow the same trend. The trend is the same, but you can see that the spacing is quite different. That is the main hallmark difference is this, in the center of the screen, they seem to be yes, equally spaced almost. But then as you move away from the center of the screen, the new analysis predicts the increase in the spacing between adjacent fringes. So this is for four slits. Again, you can see for, for two slits, there are no subsidiary maxima. For three slits, you see one subsidiary maxima sandwiched between two primary maxima. For three, four slits, you can see two subsidiary maxima sandwiched between two principal maxima. So the pattern still change, so remains the same. And for five slits, you see three subsidiary maxima sandwiched between two so again, you can see the morphology and the uh, of the wave pattern, the uh, the intensity pattern distribution is almost the same. The difference is in the peak-to-peak uh, -peak distances. Okay, what about single slit experiment? So single slit experiment, as I said, you will have to increase the number of point sources to a very large number and decrease that interslit distance d to almost a zero value. In that case, we get this curve here. So you can see the new analysis and the conventional analysis. That is, in other words, this formula, that is the textbook formula and the hypolar based analysis almost concur perfectly. Okay. They perfectly overlap with each other. So the disparity is, this is called, by the way, in the textbook is called the Fraunhofer uh, diffraction pattern. Okay. This is the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern. So the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern is more or less the same as far as the new and old is concerned. The difference is more obvious or in the multiple slit experiment. And we must remember I used wavelength in the visible wavelength, that is 500, 600, and to do these uh, simulations. If you change the wavelength, obviously, uh, the disparity is going to increase. So what are the main theoretical predictions in this case, in the new analysis? The fringes are not of equal width, right? The fringes are very narrow in the center, but as you go towards the periphery, the fringes tend to expand. They tend to become wider, broader. Another thing is that the fringes are not equally spaced. These are, so these are two divergences from the existing textbook theory. So I was like wondering, okay, is this true? What I've done, is it correct? Uh, so I started searching, scouring the literature, searching for any kind of clue whether it could be correct or not. So I found this textbook uh, by Pedrotti. It's an introduction to optics. It's a good standard textbook. And this is an interferogram. Interferogram is a photograph of the interference pattern that he did for n equal to two, three, four, and five slits. And as you can see here, the, this is the center of the screen and this is the periphery. 
center, periphery, center, periphery for each of them. So you can see the subsidiary maxima as well in between the primary maxima. Uh, as you can see clearly, the center, the fringes are kind of close to each other, but as you go towards the periphery, you see that increase in spacing because the fringes are more spaced apart towards the periphery. So this is like, it gives a qualitative kind of uh, corroboration to the hypola based analysis. And by the way, he doesn't mention anything, not just him, any book that has these interferograms, they don't mention why are these spacings becoming more and more wider as you go away from the center. It's like swept under the rug. The reason is because they've missed the most important uh, action hero that's the hyperbola. Okay, if they if you paid attention to the hyperbola, they would have found this. You know, that would be the reason. So, what are the advantages of this hyperbola based analysis? It's three formulations. Well, first of all, the only assumption that is taken is Huygens 1690 uh, postulate that is, the point source axis up on a wavefront axis up, center for spherical disturbances. And so, because there are no geometrical uh, assumptions, like, you know, the screen has to be so far away, or the wavelength has to be only so much compared to the interstellar distance. Whatever predictions follow, if light does obey the laws of geometry and mathematics, then the predictions should be far more accurate because there are no assumptions beyond the Huygens principle. Another thing is, it doesn't. It should be equally valid for the near field and far field. It doesn't matter how far the screen is or how near the screen is. We don't employ any. Uh, uh, conditions or constraints on the formulas. Another thing is small and large angle. If you remember, uh, initially the classical version, there's a small angle approximation. So we can substitute sine theta with tan theta to get those positions. We don't use any such kind of small angle approximation. Another thing is we can count fringes. We know that they're not an infinite number of fringes, but a finite number of fringes, and you can actually do a count of them. Uh, and not just for the double slit, but even for any number of slits. And then from that, we can infer even the laws of distribution of uh, fringes. That is, the greater the frequency, that is, uh, violet light will have a greater fringe density compared to red light because it has a higher frequency. And uh, uh, the thing which I find most appealing about the hyperbola based approach is that it's more intuitive because you can think of light just the way Huygens thought of it. Like a whole lot of spheres coming out of a, a point source. Okay. So there are no paradoxes here, no, no uh, awkward assumptions where you say that intersecting rays of light are actually parallel to each other or parallel rays of light are intersecting somewhere. You know, those kind of uh, self-contradictory assumptions are absent. So what are the uh, practical applications? How is it useful? Well, uh, there are many applications. Uh, many of them are in the tentative stages. Some of them are fully fleshed out like this one. So here you, uh, we can actually use two point source interference to measure the wavelength of light as well as the refractive index of a liquid medium, much like how you know, the Newton's rings experiment is used to measure refractive index and the wavelength of light. So all you need is a box and you have to suspend two point sources inside the box. And between these two point sources, if they're coherent with each other, they should produce sheets of hyperboloids, a family of hyperboloid sheets between them. And where those sheets of hyperboloids intersect the walls of the box, on this wall, you'll get nice, beautiful hyperbolas, two-dimensional hyperbolas. On this wall, the hyperboloids will intersect and form nice, beautiful concentric circular rings. So the focus should be here on the concentric circular rings. Uh, depending on the distance between S1 and S2, uh, you can actually measure the ring diameter and you can uh, infer the wavelength of light. And there are formulas for that. You can find it in this paper. And if you, if you want to know the refractive index of a liquid, all you have to do is fill this box with liquid, any liquid, the transparent liquid, of course, fill it in, and then observe the circular fringe pattern. Based on the change in the diameter of the rings, you can infer the refractive index of the liquid medium. Another tentative scheme uh, is this, that is you can even use it maybe to in the future to uh, make a tabletop uh, gravitational wave interferometer. That is, uh, all you need is a single point source, two mirrors, which are kept orthogonal to each other, two screens or any kind of detectors over here and a lens to focus it. And the image of this point source that's, that forms a virtual source here and a virtual source here. So, both of them will act like uh, two point sources, except this time 
they're not in phase with each other. They'll be 180 degrees out of phase, they'll be pi out of phase. And, and when a gravitational wave enters this apparatus, so you know how a gravitational wave works. So you have an expansion in one direction, compression in the orthogonal direction, and that keeps uh, switching to and fro. So what happens is the length, this distance initially is long and this distance is short, and then it switches over, this becomes short and this becomes long. Accordingly, the light that comes out of these two point sources, they interfere with each other, forming a dark or bright pattern here. And the intensities can be measured. And based on the change in intensity on both sides, as the wave is passing through this uh, interferometer, you can actually estimate the strain. The strain is ultimately what a gravitational interferometer is supposed to measure. Okay. So it's based on the ratio of the intensities that are measured on both sides. Another thing is, remember I said that that formula J transpose epsilon, this formula here does not depend on the configuration of this uh, sources. It doesn't have to be a linear array. It could be a square array. It could be a cubic array. It could be any shape of a, a, a distribution of fringes. And we can use that in a very nice way to explain diffraction crystallography because most crystals are, uh, have a square lattice. So I've developed a formalism to help describe the interference pattern happening here due to n point sources uh, by n point sources, that is n square point sources. And then you have that famous Poisson Arago flannel experiment. Uh, the way the intensity of the spot is measured is using the flannel integrals. Uh, it's quite complicated. Uh, using this high polar based approach, you can actually do it much, much more easily uh, with just basic algebra. You don't have to uh, do much integration. Here. Another thing is, you know, a place you can apply it where the mathematics will directly transfer over to would be these cutting edge areas that is superluminal and supersonic motion because the kind of interference pattern or the geometry of the interference process between the waves is exactly Huygens construction. So you can actually measure uh, things related to the cone that's for the sonic boom, the uh, sonic cone, boom cone that's formed due to uh, uh, faster than sound propagation. Same thing with Sharonkov radiation, that's faster than light propagation inside a nuclear reactor, or in this case, in a neutrino detector. So in the neutrino detector, what they do is they measure characteristics of the rings that are formed on the walls of this detector when a neutrino is found. So that actually follows the same geometry. Another thing is, uh, you saw the Fraunhofer pattern uh, simulation. Can it be applied as well to Fresnel diffraction? So that's something I'm working on. Uh, so that's an extension of this work. Uh, another, you know, very future futuristic project uh, is this to apply it in quantum mechanics, specifically the pilot wave theory. Uh, you may have seen this experiment on uh, some videos of it, where an oil drop is made to walk on a, a vibrating surface, a liquid surface, and the, you can actually put double slits in front of the oil drop and it forms a Fraunhofer pattern. Well, not exactly a Fraunhofer pattern, but almost a Fraunhofer pattern, which means that it's a macroscopic version of what's happening at the quantum mechanical microscopic level. So this formalism can transfer there as well. And the last place would be maybe in the in the special relativity, because in special relativity, there's quite a lot of use of hyperbolas and hyperbolic geometry. And uh, since the equation derived for the hyperbola involves the time parameter, uh, the, the, it can be readily transferred into this as well, this area as well. And lastly, of course, the place where it's supposed to be applied, that is in interferometry and holography. Mm -hmm. That's in the future. And uh, just one small thing that is, remember I said that this Upsilon can even be made to accommodate, uh, can be made to accommodate the fall in the intensity and the, the amplitude. Well, that, that matrix would look like this. That is, in that case, you know, in case the, if you want to accommodate the fall in amplitude, all you have to do is just put the amplitude for each, associated with each uh, point source, A1. Thank you. Thank you for listening.